our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day, the first four verses of Savior of the Nation. Jesus told them before were so 
And especially in the few upcoming days after this account, it would cause him no small amount of grief and despair, fear. How much should we know too? And yet we still fear and doubt, don't we? When things don't go the way we think they ought in our lives, don't we wonder if God's still in control? After all, he's not living up to our expectations, our desires, our wants. But then we also know that God has promised to do good to us according to his purpose. Whatever happens. And that means God can turn evil into good. But still we question his ways, his wisdom. Luke, remember the donkey, maybe, maybe we should too. For if Jesus knows those little things, then he also knows the really big things too. So they go and get the donkey, just as he had told them. Were they stealing it? No. The Lord has need of it, they say. It's the Lord's need of it. After all, he's the one that made it. God can't steal. Only stealing can happen with us who have foolish ideas about owning and possessing things. Who love to talk about what is mine without ever realizing how foolish that really is. Without realizing that there will come a time in our lives when we won't have it anymore. It'll go to somebody else when we die. But all the time that we have, it's really not ours anyway. It's the Lord's. We're stewards of it. It's He who gave it to us. Your life, too. And the Lord has need of you, too. He blesses others through you, too. That He may ride into their lives through you. The Lord has need of it. And we see that that owner lets it go. He accepts that explanation. He believes. You know, sometimes faith is found in the most unexpected places. What are you still holding on to? What are you still holding back? Why? So they bring the donkey to Jesus and set him on it. And then he heads for Jerusalem, this too, just as he told us through the prophet Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 9 to be exact. And as he was drawing near, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. You know, I was thinking about this. I wonder who was in that crowd. Maybe Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Or maybe Bar Bartimaeus, the, the man that Jesus replaced his eyes and made him see. Or that 12-year-old girl that Jesus raised from the dead. Or that woman who had been bleeding for the same 12 years that no longer is bleeding. Maybe that man that was lying by the side of the... Bethesda pool for 38 years hoping for healing was there. Or what about that married couple from Cana where Jesus did the first miracle? But you see, everything's different now. Remember what he said after each of those miracles? He said, tell no one of this. But this time's different. He wants everybody to see where he's going. In fact, he even says that if the people remained quiet, that the stones would cry out. For this was the day that the faithful had been waiting for, but not just the faithful, all of creation. And why the silence about the miracles? 
The miracles would not redeem the world. But you see, His death and His precious blood would. This is where Jesus wants to be seen. This is where Jesus wants to be known. This is where Jesus needs to be seen, needs to be known as the crucified one, the king whose throne was made out of wood and whose crown was made of thorns. And just as he once laid in a manger made of wood, there was a multitude at that time that was also rejoicing, crying out that day. That time, though, was the angels. And their words were very similar to the words we hear today. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. But these words now say peace in heaven. Now in Jesus, heaven and earth, God and man are at peace once again. His cross atoning for the sin that separated God and man. Now there is forgiveness. Now there is peace. You see, that's the peace we really need. Peace on earth. And that greeting that goes out at Christmas is wonderful. But peace in heaven, that good news greeting at the time of Easter, that is our peace in Jesus. You see, peace on earth is fleeting and elusive. And it doesn't take long before it's gone. One war is often followed by another. One argument or one disagreement or one dispute ends when there's peace present, that peace. But peace in heaven, that's a peace that shall never end. And it is that peace that is ours even now. Even when our lives and our hearts and our world are not at peace. For it is the peace that Jesus comes and gives. When your heart condemns you, it is Jesus who comes to you and says, But I forgive you. When the devil tries to plant doubts and fears in your mind and tell you you're not worthy to be called a child of God, Jesus says, But I baptized you into me. You are mine. You are my child. And you're that child not by your works or by any merit but by His grace. And when you hunger and thirst for what this world cannot give, Jesus comes to you in His own body and blood and feeds you with what the world can never feed you with, with Himself, the body and blood that lay in the wood of the manger, the body and blood that was put up on the cross, and the same body and blood that rode into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey now rides to you in the bread and wine. A haven of peace in a world full of confusion. Now, chronologically speaking, this reading today of Jesus entering Jerusalem belongs to Palm Sunday at the end of the Lenten season. But theologically speaking, it's so fitting for today, the first Sunday of the new church year, the first Sunday of Advent for Advent, isn't just about getting ready for Jesus coming as a babe of Bethlehem. But it's more about getting ready for Jesus coming again at the end of time. Christmas is part of that. For Jesus' second coming, he had to come a first time. And he came as a child to be born of man that he might become of the flesh to deliver those of the flesh. To save us from our sin. So Palm Sunday is part of that. It's part of Jesus' first coming. His birth allowed him to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. But it's the first advent that brings it all together. So that you can wait patiently and excitedly for the second advent, the second coming with confidence and joy. When Jesus comes not as the babe of Bethlehem, but as a conqueror, and not on a donkey, but in the clouds, and not humbly, but in glory. When he comes not to die, but to take those who would die to life once again, eternal life, his life in him. 
And you can wait for that in confidence and joy because the Lord who is coming again, in fact, already is coming to you even here and now with His forgiveness and peace that you might be ready. So that when He comes again, it will not be as a stranger, but as the one you have known all along. Your good shepherd, you know His voice and He knows yours. He is the one who cared for you and has fed you and protected you and was with you always, even until the end of your age, or this. That's what Paul was talking about when he wrote to the Thessalonians, as we heard today, when he said, listen carefully. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. Jesus is doing that now by coming to you with his forgiveness and his love that you may abound in it. That your hearts may be blameless in holiness. His holiness given to you as the gift. That when he comes again with all his saints, you welcome him even as the crowds did that day singing out boldly, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in fact, we do that very thing. We proclaim his death and look forward to his return every time we have a communion service. And it's all here, it's all for you, for he is here for you. And all this, just as he told you, that you know. Now, we don't know how Christmas is going to turn out or how our lives are going to turn out or even how the rest of this year is going to turn out. But he knows even the little things like donkeys so that whatever is happening in your life, whatever struggles and doubts, whatever fears and trials, they're not too small for him. Jesus knows. And he knows what you need, and he knows you need him. And so he comes for you as surely as he did in the past, and as surely as he will in the future. He comes now with his forgiveness, with his life, and with his peace, that they may be yours, and he is yours, and you are his, because of all that he has done, just as he told you. We continue now with the last four stanzas, or pardon me, stanzas five through eight, of Savior of our nations come. We'll rise for the final stanza.
God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Please be seated. 